same God that will win tomorrow. For he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. If he had a mighty hand yesterday, then he has a mighty hand today. And he will have a mighty hand tomorrow. And so we do not know the future. But we know that God's hand is mighty in the future. Pero sabemos que la mano de Dios es poderosa. Praise the Lord, everyone. Good morning, and welcome to our conference, and welcome to our leadership seminars. And today we have a privilege to have a number of speakers with us that I believe will be a blessing to you. You will be edified and you will be um, encouraged in the Lord. So I'd like us start to start by praying. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for the privilege of coming together in this fashion. We thank you for our speakers, Bishop Francis, who will be leading in teaching us and the other speakers that will follow. We pray your blessing upon them. We pray that they will speak with clarity and we pray that the body of Christ will be blessed and edified. So we commit them into your hands and we commit all our ministers and leaders into your hands that Lord, you will strengthen and encourage them and let them be edified through the teaching that will take place. We give you thanks for your kindness and your goodness. And Father, we thank you for the grace that you've given to us all. So we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. It is my great pleasure um, to introduce our first speaker, um, which is our own Bishop Leroy Francis. And he will be speaking to us on a subject that is dear to our hearts. And it's a leadership and succession training. Bishop comes highly qualified. He, he runs vibrant churches. He has a large number of ministers working under him. So I'm sure succession training has been part of his own arsenal for their spiritual growth and development. So it is my good pleasure to welcome our own Bishop, Bishop Leo Francis. Amen. Thank you, our Bishop Ellis, and greetings to each and every one of you this uh, morning. Um, I know we're connected by either Facebook or YouTube, and we are thankful for this day and this, um, thankful for the opportunity to be able to share with you all on the subject of leadership and succession training. I want to thank Bishop Ellis and the London and South District Board for uh, giving me this opportunity uh, to teach. Uh, the scheduled lessons, effective leadership with the family will follow after this lesson. So we must ask ourselves, why is leadership and succession training so vital and important? We are obviously geared for growth and progress. Ed Stetzer wrote an article when he did a research on the Pentecostal church and the article said, why do these Pentecostal keep growing? He says, Pentecostal, they are growing because they believe the spirit of God is moving in a powerful way. Pentecostals believe they have something worth propagating, and that's worth learning from. In an article uh, relating to uh, church or religious growth right across the spectrum globally, uh, World Christianity by the Numbers, George Wiggle, I quote, he said, the most astonishing number in the survey in both Pentecostal and charismatic Christians. In 1900, there were just under a million. Today, there are 643 million. 
and there are projected to be over 1 billion charismatic and Pentecostal in the year 2050. In raw numbers then, charismatic and Pentecostal Christianity is the fastest growing phenomenon in world religion. It is said that in Acts, the book of Acts, it took three years for the church to see a million souls receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. Today, over a million people are receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit every year. Our membership, church districts, will more than double in the next 10 years with the vision plans of the United Pentecostal Church of Great Britain and Ireland. More pastors, teachers, leaders at the local uh, district and at national level will be required. Succession planning is required to provide sustainability to this growth and progress that we are anticipating and has already started. Someone has said succession planning is a strategy for identifying and developing future leaders at our churches and in our organization, not just at the top, but at all levels. No, succession planning is not only for those at the top. Succession planning and training is for those at all levels in the church. Jesus developed at all levels. He developed the 12, Mark 6 in verse 10. He called 12 disciples and he sent them out two by two and gave them power over unclean spirit. Not only did he develop 12, he developed 70. Luke 10 and verse 1. Uh, he appointed 70 others also and he sent them out two by two. Jesus developed 12. Jesus, he developed 70. He developed three. He, we know that Peter, James, and John were the three. Um, when Jesus went to the mountain of transfiguration, he didn't take 70, he didn't take 12, he took three. Why? Because his training uh, and development for the su his succession and the, the ministry of the ministry was going to continue. Amen. And these individuals were being trained and prepared for that. He developed 12, he developed 70, he developed three. He also developed one. The uh, disciple John is arguably the closest one to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we come to one-to-one -one, uh, training and one-to-one -one mentoring. And we have wonderful example in the scriptures of this. We have Moses and Joshua plan. We have um, the Elijah and Elisha plan, where Elisha followed and he served Elijah. And through observation, attending the schools of the prophet, uh, uh, the, uh, 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 the anointing of God, the mantle representing the anointing fell on Elijah. Then we have Barnabas and the uh, John Mark uh, succession plan and training of the ministry. John Mark was um, taken around on circuit training, uh, on the job training by Barnabas. And then, of course, we have Paul uh, and two other uh, young uh, men which would eventually become bishops in their own right. And that was Timothy and that was Titus. And so Paul worked with. So we, here we see how that succession training scripturally and biblically uh, is working on all level. It is succession, yes, at the top, but then it's succession throughout the entire level of ministry. 
And so today we want to share and with you some practical things, some, some hands-on thing to do that will help you in training your leaders and preparing others for succession. First of all, you we need to be intentional. This lesson, we we just cannot hear this lesson and, and go away and, and, and things are the same. We must have some action. We must determine that we are going to prepare individuals for succession. We're not going to wait until we are healed or we're not going to wait until we are uh, age um, and nearly burn out, um, but we need to be totally focused and we need to prepare now. It is said that when it's always good to hand over the baton while you still have some strength, it makes the, while you while both you, amen, and the, your future successor or individuals that is gonna become the head of a department, that you bring them up to speed. Don't hand the baton to them uh, when, when, when it, they're not there. Don't drop the baton. And so we have to be intentional. First of all, make a list of all key leadership position in your church. Now, this will vary dependent on the, the size of your church. Um, if you have a congregation maybe of, say, 30 or so, chances are your leadership position uh, in that church may amount to maybe six or seven. However, uh, let me just add this. When it comes to visionary uh, forecasting for the church, you need to list all the departments as if you were a church running 250, although you have 30. What that is saying, vision say one day, we are going to be uh, a congregation running into hundreds of members and we will need these departments. However, for now, yes, we, we'll have six departments. It could be uh, the, the pastor, um, then you have um, the, the men's leader, ladies leader, Sunday school leader, youth leader, etc. So may possible someone in charge of them. List all of your leadership your key leadership position, okay? If your church is larger, running into hundreds, possibly added up to, to, a, to a thousand, then that leadership list, your department, uh, everyone will have a leader. It's always good to have everyone to have an assistant leader. So you have um, all of these key leadership position uh, listed. Next, create a job description that would include roles and expectation. Okay, uh, a job description for the, the youth leader uh, will state that he is, that person is responsible for the youth work, uh, organizing uh, services spiritually for the young people, then uh, organizing uh, rec recreational activity for the uh, young people. Uh, some of the challenges that young people uh, meet when it comes to uh, education, uh, when it comes to relationship, uh, a whole list of those um, uh, would be included in that job description, but also roles and expectation. When you give that leader that job description, you, that leader is expected to manage a committee to all regular meetings, uh, to plan and to prepare, appoint somebody that will be of a, a secretary or a finance secretary uh, that will take care of the finance, uh, a recording secretary, someone who would record the minutes. And so, and then uh, you may have special meetings for that, that person, young person, i.e. Uh, once a year, there would be a youth crusade of some description, and maybe once a year, it's their responsibility to have um, some missionary uh, trip uh, endeavor for the young people to be very active in. So create a job description, but also 
including it, roles and expectation, i.e., this is what I'm expecting from you as a leader. It needs to be written down. It needs to be verbalized. Thirdly, connect each leadership position to your vision, goals, and objective. Now, this lesson is not primarily about vision casting, but whatever your vision is for the church, uh, we're now into 2021, uh, looking to go into uh, uh, the next 10 years or nine years, uh, 20, uh, 30. So most churches now are looking at a 10 year plan uh, of how their church will grow in this decade. Whatever it is that your vision is, could be the purchase of building. Uh, it could be uh, to double your membership. Um, or it could be to plant further churches or daughter works, etc. Whatever it is your vision, um, connect all the leadership position that you have listed in number one into your vision and uh, into your goals and objectives. So whatever your vision is, say, for the next 10 years, then the youth leaders, I just drew an example from that, the youth leader, how would you see the youth department in 10 years? Okay, uh, you're going to plant da uh, daughter works, you're going to have extension works, um, you're going to uh, purchase a building, etc. How will um, your the youth department, as well as your other leadership, the Sunday school leader, um, the men's leader, the, the ladies' leader, um, as such as the usher, the department, all of these leaders, are there. they must all be connected to your vision. And in that written document of what your vision, and I'm going to be large, uh, um, but at least uh, there's a blueprint there. Uh, when you look at your vision plan for your church, we see all the key leadership position listed therein. And let me say this, if you do not have such a document, start, endeavor that within the next uh, three to four weeks, you're going to have one of these uh, documents for your church. So now we have all the key leadership position identified. They've all got their job description. They all know uh, what the expectations are. Um, it's quite possible you may have uh, some departments which you require an individual. As the leader or as the pastor, we must now prayerfully seek God to identify individuals for each of those positions. Remember that as a church, amen, we are governed and we are guided by the biblical principle of leadership and uh, qualification, um, characteristic, characters, characteristics of um, uh, integrity and, and, and honesty. Uh, and so um, it is it's so, it, those things are, are, are so important as we prayerfully identify individuals for each of these positions. Um, the individuals may not necessarily have all the qualities that is required, but if you sense in their heart that they they have they are faithful, they are reliable, they are teachable. Those are great qualities to give someone uh, an opportunity to work in the leadership role. Once you've done that, then create a timeline i.e., I mentioned earlier, when you connect leadership to your vision, that you um, have goals. In creating a timeline, you we have short-term goal, mid-term goal, and long-term goal. Here's what short-term goal look like. Uh, individual just become, become a leader, so uh, list what you would like to see happen within the next six months to a year. That's that's short term. Midterm, possibly what will happen to the next two or three years. And long term, God, maybe five or, or 10 years later. But actually create a timeline and and and, and cast uh, these uh, 
uh, uh, vision. When I became senior pastor of Life Tabernacle uh, in, in 2001, I shared a, a vision with the, with the church, which I at that time believe would have would have been fulfilled within 10 years. And uh, in back then, uh, it's now uh, about some 21 years ago. Um, we had uh, one person in the office. Um, we had um, one uh, the the founding pastor, senior pastor. He was the only pastor on, on paid paid um, staff. And so I, I casted a vision of because Live Tabernacle becoming a thousand member resource church, resource uh, spiritually with spiritual gifts, resource uh, financially, and resource with the ministry, the fivefold ministry that we will be able to share uh, with uh, share with with um, the. Um, the the locally and nationally and and even globally the ministries that we're in life tabernacle and then so we cast a vision and to to have full-time staff and we had to uh discuss with the church board approval to increase our staffing uh to have paid staff and uh, mo uh being a multicultural church um the, the vision was to see um, these different ministries grow and uh, to expand. And at the time, um, we were uh, something like 200, 200 in, in, in 200, 250 or so in, in, in membership in our constituency. Uh, now we're up to something like 500. Um, we have um, one, two, three, four, up to four, five. Uh, uh, individual um, that are paid staff. Um, the and part of the uh, the vision was to have two uh, ministers on full time staff. Uh, the vision was cast to have up to seven uh, licensed ministers in in Life Tabernacle. I'm happy to say that uh, we've now more than exceeded that. And uh, the one area of the vision that is that I want to see fulfill is the more full-time pastors and paid staff pastorally on uh, in, in Life Tabernacle. So that's just an idea of short-term, mid-term, and long-term goals. Now, let me say this, depending on the size of your church, uh, you need to evaluate what would be your short-term, mid-term, and long-term plan, I believe, as they would um, vary. Then, what you need to do next is to document and evaluate progress and effectiveness. And um, this can be done in, in several ways. Every year, uh, I believe that the, the church, the pastor and his staff, and in this case, it could be his, his, uh, his, his church board or his pastoral board, or depend on the size of your church, it may be the pastor and all of the department leaders. At least once a year you meet and each department submit a report. In that report, it should contain the positive and the negative. If all you're getting is reports that everything is good, everything is great, and there is no problem, there is no challenge, <laughs> you know, something is wrong. Your documented uh, report when it comes to evaluation should include both the positive and the negative so that the negatives can be addressed so that you show your strength. It should also reflect your weakness. So the weakness are, weaknesses can be addressed. What this does when it comes to leadership and succession and training, it is providing on the job training and development. When you have these meetings with document and you evaluate progress and effectiveness. You as a leader, as a pastor, amen, you are able to see where individuals are and equally you are able to uh, give them direction. On the other hand, they see how you are working and then you, uh, they have the opportunity to learn from yourself and Zon. So we must be intentional and if you haven't got those things in place yet. Uh, let me just um, remind you, the, uh, make a list of all your key leadership positions. And sometimes if you already have that list, 
review those lists and create job description roles and expectation, connect the leadership to your vision, prayerfully identify each position, uh, create a timeline, uh, short-term, mid-term, and a long-term goals and e uh, documentation for evaluating progress and effectiveness. Another important role and area when it comes to leadership and succession planning is that of mentoring. Now, we're not majoring on mentoring today, but in the literature that we will share with you that the Secretary uh, Treasurer will, um, will share with everybody, uh, all the ministers in the district and those who request the information, mentoring is so, so, so important uh, for future roles in leadership. Chuck Miller of the Barnabas Project identified this type of leadership in these four principles of leadership. It is you as the leader, okay, you are uh, doing your work in leadership and others are observing or the mentee is observing. So you do it they observe when it comes to mentoring you now bring that person beside you and uh, this uh, would be more like the elijah elisha um, leadership and training for succession i do it you are with me and then you do it i am in the background encouraging you and then you do it, I'm hands off, I've taken a few steps back, and I'm with you in spirit. You are now old in the rain. So let's see what does that look like in practic in a pra practically. So let's take um, chairing uh, a, a church board meeting or chairing uh, a, min a minister's meeting or chairing uh, uh an, an agm as such so who is in the chair in the leadership so i'm in the chair you're observing me um chairing the meeting now i want to bring you closer to me so what i do now i invite you to to sit uh with me as a co-chair so I am doing it and you are now with me. And with uh, co-chairmanship, it says, all right, I want you to chair this section of the meeting, i.e. Uh, matters arising from the minutes. I want you to deal with all the questions, all the individuals, amen, that, that will equally uh, respond. And then, um, then the, maybe the next meeting you say, okay, I'm gonna be in the meeting, but I want you to completely chair this meeting. And so that is you're now doing it and I am with you in spirit. I have four assistant pastors in Live Tabernacle and we have um, a church board of some uh, eight to nine individual and um, the church board, both the church board and the pastoral board reflect the um, inecticity of the church, the different cultures, uh, background that we have. These are all reflected in the pastoral church board and also in the uh, church board of trustees. And so from time to time, I would ask any one of the assistant pastors, first of all, it was, uh, they would be obviously be in the meeting, observing me, me chairing the, uh, those meetings, and then, uh, I would make them co-chair. Uh, now I'm confident I have um, two, three of those assistant pastors that they are proficient and they could chair any of those uh, given meetings. When it comes to planning an anniversary service, once again on the pastoral board, we would prepare that. And I would run the same principle, draw up beside me, this is how we do it. Some of the pre-planning meeting, pre-planning stages, I bring them on earlier. And then when it comes to having the full committee, uh, they are ready to sit in the chair, uh, uh, ready to, to plan and organize the entire um, anniversary. So 
there with that's um, um just a, a brief uh, uh, uh example there of the of mentoring i do it uh, i do it with you now you do it you do it and i'm behind you supporting you we want to put some action into what we are sharing today and so let's have a look at the action list first of all in action we want to link we want to find those that are called to the ministry under your ministry we're dealing with leadership and succession training if you see an individual in your church an individual under your ministry and you see their gifting and you see uh, the potential for a ministry, as it were, uh, to develop within them, what you need to do is to affirm their gifting and ministry, i.e. tell them, speak into their lives. My pastor and, and mentor, uh, Reverend James Dallas, who's now gone on to be with the Lord, he did this with, with, with me in so many different ways. I remember once I was um, in charge of evangelism, and so I thought in preparing the evangelism team, we would learn about other individuals, other cultures, and their, their religion. So I shared it with them, and he's looked at it. He says, uh, Brother Leo, this, this 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 is good. Um, you need to share this with other churches. And as a general superintendent, he wrote a letter to saying that I have um, a lesson that I've prepared. You know, invite Brother Leroy to come in and teach us in your church. And one of the first person to take that out was Brother Kelly uh, in Scotland. And I remember going there and, and teaching that lesson. And that was the beginning of a great relationship with uh, Brother Kelly. And of course, later on with many others, we were teaching in the part-time and in the, the full-time and Bible school. And so what Brother Dallas did, he, he affirmed, amen, that within me, there was this ability to teach. There was this ability to develop lessons and then therefore, all right, to uh, communicate it. Find those that are called to the ministry and uh, identify with them. Speak into their lives words of affirmation. Um, I re recently, one of our uh, men that was just recently just received a local license said, uh, oh, I didn't see anything in me, but I he said, Bishop spoke into my life and and now he's a licensed minister and actively involved in the church in evangelism, etc. And when he said that, I was trying to remember, what did I say to him? And I recall just a, a couple of brief conversation. He was very enthusiastic. He was very evangelistically focused. And um, he had a big smile. And um, he, was, he was very comfortable. Uh, uh, and he was articulate. And so I, I said to him, there is potential in your life. I believe that God's hand is upon your life. And little did I know that those words of affirmation, the impact that it had on him. And so when you link and you find those that are called to minister under your ministry, speak word of affirmation to them. Yes, say to them, I see this in you. I feel this in you. I believe that you can do this. So you link and then the next thing you learn. Um, you begin to, to teach them, meet with them, possibly on a weekly basis or, by, or every two weeks or monthly for training. Now, depending on the size of your church and the size of your ministry, uh, this can be done on a one-on-one -on -one, or it could be done in a group setting. Um, in, in Live Tabernacle, we ensure that every year we have uh, two leadership seminars for all the leaders that are in the church. We put these seminars on and all these leaders, they are invited uh, to attend these leadership seminars. So in your church, you'll have to just work out um, how you would do this, but then make a start. And if you don't have any leadership development program in your church, uh, make an endeavor to start with at least one, at least once a year, have 
a training seminar for all the leaders in your church. I'm sure if you would speak to our district superintendent, member of the district board, you will find that they will advise you of individual that you can call upon that will come and assist you in those uh, lesson. And of course, now uh, you can use um, video resources. There are uh, resources on the on the web for self development training, and you can download. Uh, material locally and nationally. And at the end of these lessons, there are some website resources uh, to assist you that I will um, forward to you. So uh, you can also provide reading material, share online leadership material. I have a, the habit that whenever I, um, I, I receive books and I've uh, completed them, or sometimes I have so many books, I don't have enough time to read them all. I am always passing on these books to my pastoral uh, leadership team. Um, I, I get resources that's coming in all the time through emails. And I have um, a group that's called Ministers in Training. Ministers in Training are individuals that are not licensed, uh, but they are showing potential. And uh, that they vary in age um, and experience when it comes to uh, working in the church. And what I do with this group, I, I just feed material to them. All the material I sent to them, I said, uh, this is for your information to read. But while you are reading it, if you think there's anything of value or of worth to the church, please uh, let me know, contact me, um, and we'll, we'll take it further. And there's been several individuals from time to time, they said, Bishop, I've read it. This is just great. We need to do this for our church. I said, okay, well, well, put a plan, uh, a proposal together, and, and um, let, let's bring it to the next uh, pastoral meeting. And so um, share uh, this material um, online. Our The wife of our youth pastor, Sister Betty Bardenhorst, um, she does a daily devotion for the young people uh, on a WhatsApp group. And as pastor, they put me on the WhatsApp group. So, I, I, you know, there's a lot of information going out there. So what I did, I checked the WhatsApp messages one, and, and I see she was sharing some online leadership material. The youth department was sharing online leadership material for the young people. Well, I looked at the lesson and they were fantastic lessons. Lessons on leadership style, um, leadership on biblical qualification for a leader. So I, I rang, I said, Sister Betty, this is a great lesson that you're putting on. Where did you get the material from? And she said, oh, I downloaded the material from a UPCI resource uh, on the web. And, and I said, Sister Betty, this is a great lesson. Since then, you know, we have taken those lessons and we have incorporated them in this year's leadership training at Live Tabernacle. And so I want to remind us to link, to learn, and uh, and then to train using different resources and the material that is so much material that is available out there. So link, learn, and then the next one thing, uh, let me check the time. Okay, we're doing okay, uh, is license. After development, Move those leaders and those that are showing potential for pastors. Amen. Move them into the licensing stream of the of our organization. In this case, United Pentecostal Church of Great Britain and Ireland. Move them into the licensing stream. We have what is known as a local license. That local license is there as a trainee license. It is an introduction to the ministry. An individual showing great potential can receive um, a local license and become exposed to the workings of the ministry, uh, ministers meeting, uh, the res uh, responsibility and the gifting and calling of, of being a minister. They, they, they uh, continue, as it were, to, to, to learn on, on the job. And so after develop, move them into the licensing stream, reading material, uh, use them in preaching. Um, sometimes uh, I know you're the pastor and on a Sunday, you're the one that's in the pulpit. In Life Tabernacle, we uh, begin practicing, uh, giving individuals an opportunity to develop. So what it means, the main preacher would preach maybe 30 to 45 minutes. And then we will have a potential 
leader or potential preacher or teacher, they would be given 15 minutes. So we give them um, a small um, uh, bite-sized chunk so that they can use that, they can develop. And I'm happy to say that over the years, this has proven to be a very um, uh, successful uh, model for developing uh, leaders and training them uh, when it comes to public uh, ministry. During the lockdown, uh, we've had prayer meetings, and in each of those prayer meetings, uh, the prayer meetings are held twice a day. We are now incorporating our members. Our members are now giving devotion. And out of this lockdown, uh, after lockdown is finished, I've got we've got potentially another um, uh, dozens or so individuals that are ready for pulpit uh, ministry. Let me share with you just a little bit about my my. Uh, uh, walking path. If I could just move on to the next slide. In the next slide, you would see a picture of uh, when I was ordained. I received my local license in 1983 when I was age 27. Uh, I've been preaching at the age of 22. Um, I am my dear wife, Olive. We married at 21. We went to Bible school the following year. So sometime around about that was when I really felt, you know, I need to be better organized and, and study the Bible and prepare a sermon. And, and before, I mean, I was just getting inspiration, um, uh, just a lot of inspiration to preach. But then um, in going to Bible school, I started to learn how to be strong. So I received my local license in 1983, age 27. I received my general license in 1989 uh, when I was um, 33. I remember when I was ordained in 1998, age 42. Uh, I don't know why, but there in that picture, you'll see, uh, I, b I believe uh, it was the general board and the district board, uh, but Austin, but a guy, uh, Sapperton, uh, but a Kelly is in there, and uh, Johnson Phillip, and Colin Dowdy um, was, was, they were all present, but the Dallas was officiating uh, my um, ordination. And I remember feeling that, here I was being ordained, and I wasn't quite sure what the future held. But the one thing I was sure of was that I'm, I am totally committed to the ministry of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And there was a weightiness, there was a passion, and there was a burden. And um, little did I know how that would evolve later on in the future. I share that just to say this with you, how that, how that when it comes to your development, we have got to move up to graduation. Uh, individuals in other profession, um, once they've got the one that after they have graduated, they move into their profession and let's take a doctor, they're a trainee doctor, and you and I know, you know, tr you wouldn't want a trainee doctor operating on you or doing a complicated medical procedure. However, after a period of training and on, on hands development, that medical doctor, trainee medical doctor, comes the day when he uh, accepts that he's now qualified for uh that to, to operate that procedure. And so it is in a minister. With our quantum, we need to move up and from in graduation and accept the recognition that is given. And in some time in this case, it could be moving from a local license to a general license and, and then up to ordination. And so it's moving up to graduation, accepting recognition and respecting the acknowledgement and when it comes to biblical character, that should be, be done with, with humility and servitude, which I will uh, relate to later on. And so um, in that picture, you would see that there are senior men in that picture. But Turley uh, was also there present, uh, Elder Sapperton, then you had uh, Johnson Phillip, Robert Kelly, and uh, uh, Mark Gadd, Colin Dowdy, J J Jimmy Austin, and, and and then myself there. And so there you see uh, representing, you know, um, individuals at, at different age and at different levels in their ministry. I was just beginning, um, and the, the 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 journey has been one of just a, a great opportunity. Um, 
that have uh, or should I say is, uh, is allow me to respond to opportunity as they have um, unfold. And so after making that link and learning and licensing the individual, we launched them into active ministry. Let me uh, wind up. When we launched them into active ministry, that could be preaching point, daughter works, um, home church, evangelism, pastoring, or even missionary work. In conclusion, what I'd like to share with you some things that I have learned along the road uh, during my time in, in the ministry. And some of these have been passed on to me by my mentor, and uh, of which there have been several. And let me share them with you. People are more important than program. People are more important than position. Get amongst the people. Brother Dallas did this. He wasn't a great decorator, but when we were painting or cleaning the church, he would get a pair of overalls on and he would get a paintbrush. Learn to love people. Have a passion for people. Learn to serve people. Let me say this when it comes to leadership training and succession plan. Don't be intimidated by younger ones that appear to be more talented and gifted than you. That, that in some cases, is really just natural. With a new generation and technology and all that's going on now, um, chances are they are going to be more talented and gifted than you. But don't be intimidated and don't be frightened of them. Uh, push them up the ladder. When it comes to the ladder of succession, get behind them and push them up forward. Give them opportunities. As I said earlier, speak into their lives. Don't push them down the ladder, meaning that you're just sitting on top of them, being a weight on them. But learn to push them up the ladder. You don't need to be, you don't need a position or a title to do something significant for God. But we all need to be responsible and accountable. Now, later on uh, in the study, there's, there's a lot more material, but I want to break now because uh, there are some, we want to have a time of question and answers on the whole subject of leadership and succession. There may be some things that I haven't covered and you may have a question that you would like to ask. And so with that in mind, I'm going to hand back over now to uh, Bishop Ellis. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Bishop Francis. And uh, I do have one question for you, and I hope there are many more. I wish um, we had more time to give you. However, the question is, uh, when you succeeded Bishop Dallas, uh, did you feel ready for the task? And what was your biggest challenges initially as senior pastor? Um, did I feel ready for the role as pastor? In essence, yes, and the reason for that. Uh, but at Dallas had suffered two heart attacks over the last uh, five or seven years, and um, his health was failing, although in the last three years of his life, it really just returned back to normal before he had his third third heart attack. So before his first heart attack, uh, Bishop Dallas would travel extensively and he would leave me and a, a leadership team, pastoral leadership of four in charge of the church. And of course, he was then the um, uh, general superintendent. So. Over that time, the process, i.e., of having a leadership team, pastoral leadership of four individuals, which I sat on, and I can remember over the decade, um, four different uh, pastoral leadership team, i.e., there'd be a pastoral leadership, there would be some problem individuals will lead for different reasons, etc. So, in one sense, I was being mentored indirectly. I was being prepared indirectly. Leadership and succession training was taking place. And when Brother Dallas um, was, was ill, um, uh, the amongst the leadership team, um, I had uh, more time on my because I was working. I was a self-employed individual. 
So in answering your question through whether that has given me opportunities and um, making me, moving me from uh, a minister in the church to an assistant pastor, to being an associate pastor, he had prepared me well for that moment. Biggest challenge, biggest challenge, um, biggest challenge. I'm trying to think what the biggest challenge was. I think the biggest challenge, um, be it a challenge, I'm, I remember the senior saints um, being concerned whether or not they would accept me as their pastor. And let me say, they were very kind to me, for sure. Uh, but Brother Dallas was always going to be their pastor. And so, you know, over the years, uh, they have accepted me now as their senior pastor. Um, that was a bit challenging, but I was told by Brother Dallas, you know, when I, you know, when you move into leadership, don't expect everybody to endear to you, because some are just waiting to see how you will do. Uh, so, Bishop Ellis, I hope that answered your question. <laughs> Um, it wasn't my question, Bishop, but yes, I think he did. It was from a, a Razier Sharp. Bishop, um, I think we acknowledge this is a really important subject. Now, not to be unfair to you, but in your role as general um, superintendent, what is your message to pastors in line of this subject? Quite clearly. Every pastor needs to look and say, you know, um, do you have a successor? And I'm not talking about waiting till you are old, because we all know that we could be incapacitated due to some illness as such. And if that was to happen to us now, do you have a successor? Have you prepared or trained others? And so my message to all the pastors is that if you do not have a successor that you now begin to put in action some of the things that we have shared with you. As I mentioned, um, it could be a, a, a younger individual, uh, it could be a, a faithful individual, but you now need to invest in individual. Um, I would like to say to the pastor, in, in giving individuals opportunity, um, we, we practice it. If we see individuals with potential, bring them along to the minister's meeting. Uh, bring them into your board meeting. Bring them into your leadership meeting. Share with them your vision. Share with them your plans for the, for the future, for the church going forward. Don't be an island all by yourself, but connect these individuals with you. Thank you, Bishop. Um, now, there's another area, Bishop, perhaps, once again, it's a difficult question. Given that not all pastors um, may be doing all the things that perhaps they should be doing, do you see yourself as general superintendent with a role of somehow trying to nudge pastors in the right direction such that people under their ministry could be developed. Okay, uh, Bishop Ellis, um, I think I'll, let me just make sure I understood the, qu the question, right? That where I see other pastors um, wanting to not use the word, nudge them into developing uh, other individual. Yes, um, the, the my, my observation, even in, in the United Pentecostal Church of Great Britain and Ireland, is that we do have a number of pastors that are now entering into what I would call seniority. And the, uh, just as I said before, you know, um, um, who do they see, all right, as possibly, you know, the, their successors or or individuals that could succeed. Because, you know, in some churches, you may have more than one in, individual um, to, to that you are training or indeed that you are developing. In terms of nudging the ministers, yes, I trust that through uh, corresponding and through communication, through vision casting and, and goal settings, 
and communicating this to our the pastors, we are leading from the front in casting vision and um, setting goals and an objective to reach. It is so important to us that the local church, the local pastor, the local members of the church, amen, are trained and that they are developed. And the pastors have got to um, uh, connect uh, the members in their church, individuals that are shown gifted and talented, to, to connect with them, invest in them, and, and, and bring them, them forward. Um, I'd like, like maybe what time is it? L let me share, share with you uh, an inspiration that I just just uh, uh, and, and this is uh, from one of the fastest growing uh, churches organization in the UK, and their uh, bishop cast a vision to say um, that he wanted there to be a church within ten minute walk of every Nigerian. By now, you would have gathered it's a Nigerian-based church. However, what the that with that vision cast the the members got a hold of that vision. Within the space of what twenty five years, they have reached seven hundred churches here in the UK. Within a five year period, they planted two hundred and ninety six churches. And what what was that then there was the concept was that in Nigeria, in some areas where transportation is poor, uh, people walk to church. Here they came to the UK with that same concept, which you think is completely out of sync, but they applied it and responded to it. I'm believing that our pastors and with the growth that is anticipated would realize and and connect with the vision and start preparing leaders amen that would be the next pastor there would be the next district superintendent they would be the next district missions coordinator etc there's no more questions but i i personally want to say thank you to bishop francis and and i would like to encourage all pastors um we all have different giftings um but to have a good teacher and a good leader is a, is a tremendous resource for the body of Christ. And I would I would like to encourage pastors if you know if they need help, you know, you don't need to speak openly, give Bishop a call. And you know, there's lots of lots. I remember the late um, Bishop Dallas, Bishop Francis pastor. He took me aside one day and he did exactly what Bishop was speaking about. He says, William, I see God is going to use you. He wasn't my pastor, but he was my bishop. And I never forgot it because just to take a young man aside and to speak into my life did affect me. And it affected me greatly. So I would say to other pastors, please, uh, the church needs you, and you, the church needs you to build others under you. So let us speak well, and let us do as much as we can to raise up another generation of leaders. Bishop, thank you so much. Uh, don't be surprised if you get lots of invites to come and teach <laughs> and to help the body of Christ. Amen. We are very, very grateful to you. Now, our next session starts within five minutes. We will have a five-minute break. Our next speaker would be uh, Reverend Johnson Phillip, um, and I'm really looking forward to the next session. It's effective leadership and the family. And so Johnson Phillip, Pastor Johnson Phillip will be speaking to us in, the, uh, in, in five minutes' time. We'll have a five-minute break. God bless you now. y para cantar y orar y a veces cansado a veces no señor si usted está aquí déjeme decirle a manera de profecía porque es bíblico también si usted vino a este lugar usted será un trabajador como ese hombre antes no te va a cosechar no te va a tirar no te va a decorar y va a arreglar y preparar ese fruto hasta que ese fruto esté listo gloria a Dios
mercy seat is still covered just like Ananija there is mercy at the horns of the altar so he could live even though he deserved to die because Jesus is the one that can take away your sins Jesus is the one by which you must obtain mercy Jesus is the one that when you seek after mercy you will find him hallelujah welcome back um must say once again thank you to bishop francis for an excellent session and for those who are not aware these sessions will remain on our london and south district youtube channel as a resource center so if anyone missed the session they need to just tap into the london and south district youtube channel and those recording of our seminars will be there now, it is my great pleasure to welcome on our next speaker, um, Reverend Johnson Philip, pastor of the church in Catford. Not only that, he, he, he was the dean of our Bible school, the London and South Bible School. He's now the honorary dean of Apostolic Training Institute. And Brother Philip has been teaching leadership for a long time, so it is my Great pleasure to welcome him to speak to us, and his subject is Effective Leadership and the Family. Thank you, Brother Ellis, and praise the Lord, everyone. And it's a real privilege to be with you today. And I would like to thank the District Board for inviting me to cover this subject today. and. Thank you to them, and I greet all of you in the beautiful name of the Lord. The subject I have been given is leadership and the family. Very important subject, subject that will take a long time to complete. So I've only got a limited time, so I'll only be touching a few things. But by way of scripture, I would like you to turn to the book of First Timothy, chapter 3, verses 1 to 7. First Timothy, chapter 3, verses 1 to 7. And I would like to read in your hearing. This is a true saying, if any man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy, of filthy liquor, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous. One that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the house of God? Not a novice, Lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into the into reproach and the snare of the devil. I would like to draw your attention especially to verse 5. It says, if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? And also in verse 7, moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without. In the context of that, I would just like to say that 
God has an order of priority when it comes to leadership. First of all, there is God. Then there is the family. Then there is the church. That God instituted the family before he instituted the church. And we must have that as a priority that we always put God first in everything. And then secondly, we put our family second and the church third. If we do not follow this order of priority, it will lead to problems in our ministry. As you know, we are living in a pandemic. And it, there is a lot of pressure. There's a lot of pressure on leaders at this time. Pandemic or not, there is always a lot of pressure on leaders. There's pressure to get it right in the church. And there is pressure to get it right in the home. And we know the devil is trying to fight us in everything that we do. In the natural, it is very difficult to be working full time and also having a home to run as well. It's even more difficult when we, when we actually are involved in church ministry to be involved in church ministry as well as running a home. It is very, very difficult. Therefore, we need God, amen? Especially if we want to make a success of both. When it comes to the natural, relate the marriage counseling organization say that the their most busiest time of the year is christmas that's when families are together for a long period of time for about a week and because they are not used to that they there are problems that they experience and is heightened when people are spending time together. The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Since 2002, Harvest Bible College has been a training ground for harvesters around the world. The fully accredited program is designed to instill the Word of God, equip students for their calling, and to enable them to pursue the will of God at all costs. In one moment, our lives were altered. Church no longer looked the same. School no longer is the same. Our world no longer the same, but God is doing a new thing. Forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Will you allow God to alter you at an altar? Will you build your altar, step into the calling he has given you, and follow it no matter the cost? Will you alter the way you see Bible college? Be trained equipped and empowered to be the apostolic voice our world needs. Know the word, apply the word, share the word. Is this a way God has called you to be altered? Praise the Lord. 
I apologize for that. Amen. I'll try to reorganize myself. Sorry about that. Okay, as I said, the pandemic has, stre has put a lot of emphasis on people being together. And it's put a lot of strain on relationships, especially the family. And Christians are not exempt to that. We know that. But we realize today that God is with us. But you know, in reality, the heightened numbers of instances of domestic abuse has been highlighted in the press and in media and there's pressure and unfortunately I have to say that there is domestic abuse in the church and we have to really ask God to help us in this situation but that's the reality of church life as it is at the moment and the lockdown is putting a lot of strain a lot of pressure on people as i said there's a lot of pressure on leaders at the moment a lot of pressure and that pressure comes from from different angles first of all first of all there is pressure it's as if the family, the church family, is living in a goldfish bowl. And we are expected as leaders to have a perfect marriage, be a perfect husband, be a perfect wife. be a perfect father and be a perfect mother. And that pressure is felt very, very strongly when it comes to leadership in this church. There is also extra scrutiny on children and the children of leaders and there's a lot of pressure on them to be perfect children. And we know today that none of us are perfect, but it is expected of us to conduct ourselves in a certain way. So there are pressures, but God and everything about God is excellent, and we we look to God in every situation and everything that we do must be excellent as well. And when it comes to leadership, we have to aim for excellence. When it comes to the family, we have to be excellent and endeavor to be excellent in everything that we do. So God is expecting us to really try our best to have godly leadership and a godly family life. I'm moving around here with my phone because we've had technical problems earlier. So forgive me if I'm moving around with the phone. Let me say that effective leadership and leadership itself is based on relationship. First of all, our relationship with God. Secondly, our relationship with our family. And then our relationship with the church. It has long been established that the home is the most important training ground is the best training ground 
for leaders, not the church, not the platform, not in front of a group of people, but the home is the best training ground for leaders. And that has proven so true in the past. Amen. In verse 7 of 1 Timothy chapter 3, which we read, it talks about the leaders must have a good report of them which are without, not just in the church. And that is very important because the key word to effective and excellent leadership is consistency. We must be consistent in everything that we do. What does that mean? What we see in the church is what should be seen in the home. Therefore, if a leader is to be successful, what they are like in the church is what they should be like in the home. But not just in the home, if a if a leader works full time, their character and their testimony must be the same at work and in society as well. We know that's consistent. Amen. And we know today that God wants us to be consistent. He doesn't want us to be one person in church and then a different person at home. I personally, I am a husband, I am a father, and I am a grandfather. I do not pronounce myself to be perfect in any of these areas. I'm still learning. In fact, this year, we will be celebrating 40 years of marriage in August of this year. Also, this month of February, I will be celebrating 40 years as a minister in the UPC. So I've, I've learned a little over the time that I've been a minister and a husband and I've been a father and a grandfather. And it's very important that I am consistent. So what people see in church is what they should see at home. And it's very important that we are honest and consistent with that. I cannot emphasize that strong enough because there are many leaders who portray an image at church. But when it comes to the home, it's a different person that we're dealing with. That's why you need to ask the wife, how are they at home? We need to ask, if there are any children, how are they at home? And it's very important that we are consistent. Can I just give a little tip for those of you who are invited to preach at different churches where you are not the pastor? If at all possible, always bring your wife or your spouse with you. Always. There are two reasons for that. One is they keep you honest. For example, preachers are very good at exaggerating. I'm not saying that preachers lie. Because preachers don't lie. They just Sometimes they exaggerate. For example, 
I can stand in front of a congregation and say, I pray one or two hours every day. And I'm, I'm impressing the congregation. But if my wife is sitting in the congregation and, you know, wives have a way of giving a look to say, yeah, when was the last time you did that? I hope you're understanding what I'm saying. They keep us honest because they see us in church and they see us at home. Therefore, we must remain consistent in our testimony, consistent in our character, consistent in our integrity. Also, by your spouse being there, they keep you humble as well. Because they know you. They live with you. So they know the kind of person you are. And if you try to portray yourself as being somebody that you're not, trust me, they will remind you. So it's very good that wherever possible, that we take our family with us, and I'll go on to that later on. So one of the keys to having a successful leadership life, effective leadership life, and having a, a successful family is being consistent. Praise the Lord. Amen. And I'm trusting the Lord that he is helping us to be like that. Amen. Praise the Lord. As a leader, let me talk to the leaders now. Your most important job is not the church, but is leading your family. We read in again in First Timothy chapter three if a if a person cannot rule his own home, how can he come to church and rule and reign and run the church effectively? And as said, there's a lot of pressure on leaders for to the, to actually do that. But reminding yourself today that God instituted the church. Secondly, he introduced into he installed it, the family first. Our responsibility as leaders is to lead our family, especially a wife and if there's any children, children as well, so that we can be successful. And it's the will of God, I believe, for us to be successful leaders as well as successful leaders of our family. Amen. If, as a leader, you put church activities and church people before your family, you are asking for serious trouble. You are asking for serious trouble. And when there comes to divorce, you know, sometimes they say, is there a third party involved? And sometimes when it comes to church leaders, the, ch the third party in divorce proceedings is the church because you spend too much time at church, too much time with church people and other church brethren to the neglect of your family. And that has cost some marriages and put strains on marriages simply because you're prioritizing the wrong people. Every leader must have family time. Every leader must spend 
more time with their family than they do at church. As the leader, you, you are not expected to be at everything all the time in the church. That's what delegation is all about. And you've heard from Bishop Francis the importance of preparing people and preparing other people. I know some churches, if the pastor is away, church doesn't go on. And that is a very unhealthy position for a church to be. I also know that if people know the pastor is away, they don't go to church until the pastor comes back. That is too much emphasis on one individual. You need to get to the place where you can delegate, you can train others to run the church in your absence while you spend time with your family. It's very important, and I know money is typed and everything like that, but it doesn't take a lot of money to spend holidays together with your family. It's very important that you go away as a family. I remember when my son was born, the first service he attended was when he was three weeks old. The first general conference he attended was when he was three months old. And the first overseas trip he took with us was when he was about two years old, when he was able to fly. And from that time, I have always held the principle, if we cannot go somewhere together, we don't go at all. So every time I go abroad, I take my wife and family with me as much as possible, simply because we need to spend time together, quality time, and put less strain on our relationships. And I'm, I'm mindful that time is limited, finance is limited, but you don't have to spend a lot of money to spend time with your family. You don't have to go to an expensive restaurant or go into an expensive hotel. You can spend time together. And I cannot emphasize that more than I am because if you spend more time with church brethren and church activities than you do your family, as I said, you are asking for serious, serious trouble. Pressure is everywhere. We know that. Amen. And as a leader, you have to put your family before church. That may not go down well with some people because they want to say, well, I'm called to be a minister. I'm called to be a preacher. I'm called to be a pastor and so forth. Therefore, I always put God first in everything and, and use language like that. Yes, all that is accurate, but you need to realize your first priority of relationship after God is with your family. And I want to just leave a statement with you. And my time is nearly up. Reminding you that leaders and pastors especially can always get others to meet the needs of the church. But God has called you as a leader to meet the needs of your family. 
Let me repeat that again. That you can always get someone to preach. You can always get someone to lead prayer meeting. You can always get someone to plan and to organize a service. You can always get someone to lead an all-night prayer meeting, a Sunday school class. But you cannot get anyone to lead and meet the needs of your family. That's your responsibility. That is your calling. And Paul mentions it over and over again that, yes, we honor God, but we also honor our family. And let me say that you can fulfill your ministry. You can fulfill the call of God on your life and also be a good father, be a good husband, and be a good family leader. You can do both. You cannot afford to substitute one for the other or do one and not the other. You can do both. And I have proven in my own personal life, in my leadership life, and I have done a lot of things in the organization when it comes to leadership and pastoring, but I've always tried to be a good family person as well. I have not always succeeded. All you have to do is ask my wife and my son that, and they can tell you whether I've been a good husband and a good father all the time. I try to be all the time, but I've not succeeded all the time. But with the help of the Lord, I am endeavoring to do that. But I realize that they are a very important part of my ministry. And my ministry would not be complete without them. And I'm so glad that they have stood by me, stood with me, sometimes stood in front of me. But they've always supported me in everything that I've tried to do. And I, I can really be honest to say that some of the things that I have achieved, I have not been able to do it. And I might not have been able to do it without their support and their backing. Because as I said, it's consistency. And let me just leave one statement with you before I go, is that the church is the bride of Christ. The church is the bride of Christ. But your wife is your bride. Your wife is your bride. The Lord has a bride. It's the church. And the Lord is able to look after his bride <laughs> expertly and in an excellent way. But my responsibility is to my bride, my wife, amen? And if I have children, to my children as well. Leadership is very difficult. In the best of times, leadership is very difficult. It, as I've always said, if you do leadership properly, it is very difficult. It's time consuming. It's spiritually draining, mentally draining, and sometimes very physically draining as well. And sometimes when we get home, we take it out on our family. We take out our tiredness and our frustrations and our stress sometimes on our family. 
So they can, they've seen us in our best. They've seen us in our worst as well. But they've stood with us. You see, when you go to church, people only see the best. People only see the best of you. They hear the best of you. But when you're at home, they see the real you. And is the real you the same as the real you when you're at church? Let's be consistent, amen? And you know, we are good leaders and we are good family members and family leaders because of the grace of God. And I'm so glad today that the Bible is so true when it says that God's grace is sufficient for us. And his grace will allow us and empower us to be good leaders and good family leaders as well as church leaders. We can do nothing without God. And obviously, to be a, a healthy church and a healthy family is based on prayer. And I'm so glad that God has given enough grace to us to do what we do today, to withstand all the pressures that there are, both spiritually and secularly as well. Interviews were held with Satanists a few years ago, and Satanists said that their priority when it comes to prayer is the destruction of the family. We as a church need to stand up and pray for the families in our churches. In fact, the person who needs prayer the most in our church is the pastor and his family. The pastor is praying for everybody else, but who's praying for the pastor and their family? I encourage you today to pray for your pastor and their family. Pray for them that God will bless them spiritually, physically, and financially so that they will be effective and successful in everything that they do. God bless you. I'll hand over back now to Bishop Ellis in Jesus' name. Thank you so much, uh, Brother Philip, and some of the comments that are coming through is a testimony of the quality of your content and teaching. Um, I haven't got any questions, and I'm sure some will come, but I really want to commend you for being transparent and open, which is what we really need in ministry. But I, as you were speaking, I did write a question, and I took note that you've been in the organization for 40 years. And to be able to teach this, you would have seen one or two issues. So here's my question to start. From your experience as a minister in the organization of, for 40 years, what proportion of ministers would you say have problems because of family imbalance? Because of what? Sorry, I didn't hear the last part. Because of family imbalance, the very thing you're teaching about. I, I would say from conversations that I've had with fellow ministers and so forth, about a third, I would say, have had problems in their family life because of the imbalance, because they've spent too much time at church and with church. And the best person to ask probably is their wife if it's a pastor and he's married and is is the wife being neglected 
other children being neglected. And if wives are very open and very honest, they will say many times, sometimes they don't see their husband until it's late at night. Or the time they do see them is when they are tired and just worn out and just want to rest and so forth. And when the wife wants to speak to the husband, as a husband and wife, they are too tired. Not yet. And so forth. You know, later or tomorrow or next week. And I I've seen it. I know a few people who have, whose marriages are, have ended in divorce because they spend too much time in church. And that's the reality of it. They can use other issues and other excuses, but too much time doing church work has put a lot of pressure on the marriage. And some, some wives stay, but some wives just say, I've had enough, I'm gone. And that's, that's you know, unfortunately, where a few ministers that I know have ended up in divorce because of that. Thank you, Brother Philip. It would be good to hear from um, some ministers' wives, but I, I want to ask Brother Philip again, um, Brother Philip, where did it go wrong? Because we know it has gone wrong. Um, where did it go wrong? Because I know there are some pastors that teach exactly what you have taught. And there are other pastors that perhaps have not got there as yet. Is this a development issue? Is this a, a, a typical pastoral training issue? Where did it go wrong? I personally feel um, I am not a, a marriage counselor. I am not an expert at all. But dealing with people, and I've dealt with a lot of people over the years, there's a breakdown. There's a breakdown perhaps in communication. There's a breakdown in priorities that the pastor feels the church comes first because I am the pastor. It could be just pressure. There are financial pressures, work pressures if the, if the husband is working full-time and is also pastoring full-time. I remember some years ago, I... I had several positions. I was wearing several hats. I was the district superintendent. I was the dean of the Bible school. I was also building up the church in Catford. And I was also trying to be a husband and a father. I think we may have lost connection with Brother Philip, but um, I did have one more question, and if he can come back, I would appreciate it. But if he doesn't, okay. yeah, I'm I'm back. I'm back. Sorry. Can you can you hear me? Okay. Yes, we can. Okay. I realized I couldn't do all of those things, and something had to give. So I resigned one position and I stood down from another position so that I could concentrate on where my priorities were and my priorities were my family and pastoring and sometimes the pastor takes on too much that time is not spent 
finance is not spent and effort and energy is not spent on the family. And that takes its toll after a while. A question, and a very good question. Um, how do you deal with the guilt that comes from being expected to be at every meeting? You, you deal with the guilt by not having the guilt in the first place. By training and delegating pe to people in your church so that they can do the job for you. You shouldn't feel guilty because you've missed a prayer meeting. You shouldn't feel guilty if you miss a Sunday because you're on holiday. You should not feel guilty. And what is creating that guilt? It could be that you're, you're, you're thinking that you're more important than you really are. And perhaps some people are thinking, well, church won't function unless I'm there. You know, and I can do it the best. All those things may be, you know, you may be the best at what you do. But the will of God in running a church is teamwork. And the most important team that you as a pastor has is your family to begin with. And then you extend it to other members in the church. So you have to de develop a team in your church that can keep things going so that if you are very tired, if you are physically not well, if there's something else you have to go to, you know, you can do those things and know church is running smoothly because you have invested time in training. I remember when I first started developing the Catford Church, I spent one year doing nothing but training. And if I could not do it, I brought somebody in who was more qualified than me. So we have trained worship leaders. We have trained speakers. We have trained Sunday school teachers. We have trained altar workers. We have trained ushers and so forth. Because you have to invest time in training looking long term. Because I'm sure as brother, I didn't catch everything he said, but I'm sure he would have said, you're not going to be around all the time. So you need people that you've trained and invested in. And growing up as a young minister, I, I was privileged to be under the, the mentorship of the late Bishop Dallas. And if there's one thing Bishop Dallas knew how to do is he knew how to train other leaders and I've benefited from that. And I try to, I try to do the same and I can honestly say I can go away anytime from the church that I pastor. I can be away for two, three weeks at a time and I have every confidence and I know things are going to run well because I know the people who I have trained. So don't feel guilty because you stay home because, you know, you have to stay home to do something. You have to, if you're, if you're a parent, you have to go parents' evening and miss Bible study. Examples like that. Don't be guilty. Remember, it's not your church. It's God's church. And God has a way of taking care of his church. Amen. Thank you. Um, the next question, um, Pastor oh, Philip. Yeah. <laughs> can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. The next question, um, 
I think you can partially answer it, but I'll, I'll, I'll pose the question because it goes further than yourself. What has the UPC put in place to overcome these issues locally and nationally? I, I think that's a very good question for the bishop to answer. That's why I said you can only partially. <laughs> I can, <laughs> I, can, I can help my friends who are fellow ministers and I can help them. But, but as an organization, that's, as they say, that's above my pay grade. But I can, I can help my brother, my sister. I can help people in prayer, in counseling and so forth. And I can also be a, an example to them as well, the best I can. So personally, I can help. And I see Bishop Francis is on screen. So he's better placed than I am. Go ahead, Bishop. Amen. Thank, thank you, uh, Brother Philip. As, um, as Brother Philip has alluded, we are sons from the same father. Uh, Reverend James Dallas was both our pastor and mentor and trainer. Uh, and let me say this, um, what has the UPC uh, done to overcome these issues locally and nationally? Uh, in line with what Brother Philip has just taught, we concur with everything. I think in all our ministers' session um, at General Conference, we even take time out in our AGM um, when we travel around, we have um, our autumn harvest uh, convention. When it comes to the subject of the family, we always emphasize that it is God first, the family next, and ministry now. And uh, I allude to Brother Philip. And first of all, I want to con congratulate and compliment him on this excellent lesson because it, we, um, um, along with Bishop Ellis, uh, we know that you know, uh, a ministry, if, a, if an individual is not uh, living a life of, of integrity and their family is neglected, then although that ministry seems to excel, it is flawed. So we as an organization, uh, in terms of training our pastors, um, teaching what you have heard today, we continue this at national level. Um, our literature that we've given, even our reading material for an individuals to become a licensed minister, great emphasis is placed on the importance of the family. And, and I'm so glad that this has been taught today. And I didn't expect to be back on, but since I'm back on in the, in the chat, Bishop Ellis, uh, let me just appeal to all those involved in ministry, as Brother Philip emphasized about um, keeping your distance socially from the opposite sex. Um, uh, those of you that are married, you know, make sure that your wife is number one and she is your bride that you're looking after. All of those excellent points. And so we fully concur. And um, maybe the next Harvest Leadership Convention, there will be more uh, a session once again on the family. So thank you and God bless you. Thank you, thank Bishop. You, Bishop. Thank, um, Brother uh, Philip, thank you so much for an excellent session. I can see from the responses in the chat, um, this is definitely needed. Can I just ask those of you who may have friends or colleagues that um, are not um, watching this today, please can you point them to the YouTube channel um, for Brother Philip's teaching. It will remain there. And I think there's more that we can do based on the experience of ministers that we have, and indeed the issues that we know ministers, and not just ministers, um, anyone in the church, you know, any family in the church. And, um, and I think this is, this has long been overdue, and I really want to express my appreciation to Pastor Johnson Philip for an excellent sort of teaching. It could be longer, but I think we've started. And if indeed um, from our churches, we're 
Uh, I'm hearing that we need more of this. Please, you can get in touch with me. It's for us as a board to do our best to meet the needs of our district where we can. Sometimes we can't, but where we can, we will certainly try it. So I want to say once again, thank you so much, um, Brother Philip, and it's time for us to have a break, a five minute break as from now, and hereafter we'll have one final session from uh, uh, our youth leader, Richard Nathan, on a subject that I hope you will find interesting and inspiring. God bless you. Five minute break. Say God that will win tomorrow. For he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. If he had a mighty hand yesterday, then he has a mighty hand today. And he will have a mighty hand tomorrow. And so we do not know the future. But we know that God's hand is mighty in the future. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Accept greetings from my family and I and the Bethel Tabernacle Church family in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I would like to take this opportunity to greet our London and South District Board, all my fellow ministers and this district conference 2021 in the name of Jesus. I'm reminded by the word of God that indeed the Lord is our keeper, that he is our strength and defender. Amidst all the difficulties, amidst all the uncertainties, amidst all the challenges that we have faced over the last 12 months, we are here to declare that God is still in control, that God is and always will be faithful and that he keeps fighting our battles. The scripture teaches us according to 1 Samuel chapter uh, 7 and uh, in particular verse 12. It tells us that while Samuel was offering a burnt offering unto the Lord, the Philistines drew near to battle against Israel. But the Lord thundered with a great thunder on that day upon the Philistines and discomforted them, and they were smitten before Israel. Then Samuel took a stone, as it were, reflecting on who was yet to come, Jesus Christ, our chief cornerstone, and he set it between Mizpah and Shen. And he called the name of it Ebenezer, saying, Hitherto, hath the Lord helped us. Brothers and sisters, God is fighting our battles. God is our sure foundation. God is our hope. God is our help. God is our advocate and our high priest. God is our fountain of life. God is our consolation. God is, yes, our God is our yesterday, are today and indeed are tomorrow. I pray that we will have a spirit-filled conference, though virtual, yet impacting, and that many souls will come to know the Lord, whom to know is life eternal. May God continue to bless this district. May God continue to bless you and your families as we come together to celebrate our Lord Jesus Christ. God bless you. Pico y para cantar y orar y a veces cansado, a veces no sé yo. Si usted está aquí, déjeme decirle la manera de profecía porque es bíblico también. Si usted vino a este lugar, usted será un trabajador como ese hombre. A ver, no te va a cosechar, no te va a pegar, no te va a decorar. Y va a arreglar y preparar ese fruto hasta que ese fruto esté listo. Gloria a Dios.
Welcome back and thank you for staying with us. And if you've just joined us and you've missed the previous two sessions, I really want to encourage you. Um, the recording will be available on the district YouTube channel. And both sessions were excellent, Bishop Francis and also Pastor Johnson Philip. And we have one session left for the day. And this time the, the speaker will be a local youth leader, the youth leader from the Hamsmith Church. And his subject is Seven Mountains of Influence. So I want to just welcome uh, Brother Richard Nathan. And Richard, I'd like you to take your liberty and God bless you. Praise the, praise the Lord, everyone. I uh, hope you can all hear me well. And it's truly a privilege to be with you all this uh, this afternoon. Um, I greet Bishop Francis, all the ministerial body, and all the members of the churches and all of our guests and visitors that are with us um, this afternoon. And I like to teach, as, as Bishop Ellis has said, on the seven mountains of influence. But before I teach, if you don't mind, I'd just like to pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we give you thanks, Father, for this time that we are here together to be trained, to be developed, to grow and to hear from you. Father, I ask in the name of Jesus that your anointing would prevail, that you would open the heavens over us in our respective locations as your word declares that we're two or three gathered together in your name, you are there in the midst of us. So Father God, even as we're gathered together in spirit, let the glory of the Lord come and speak to us and direct us and guide us and take us to the next level and the next dimension in the things of God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Okay, so um, speaking about the seven mountains of influence, there, uh, there are two questions that need to be asked at the beginning of this session. And the first question is, who is shaping our world? I repeat, who is shaping our world? And then the second question is, what is shaping our world? And I endeavor with the time I have to answer these two questions. Um, this subject of the seven mountains of influence may be one that some are familiar with and one that some are not familiar with, but I believe it's a crucial message and understanding for the hour in which we are living. Okay, so I'm going to start by actually answering the second question first. What is shaping our world? And the things that are shaping our world are what we refer to as the seven mountains of influence. And these seven mountains I will share with you now. There is the mountain of family the mountain of education, the mountain of religion, the mountain of government, the mountain of media, the mountain of arts and entertainment, and the mountain of business. Now, these seven mountains shape and form the culture in every nation on the earth. I repeat again, family, education, religion, government, media, arts and entertainment, and business. They form and shape the culture and the environment and the spiritual climate of our nations. So I want to introduce us into this concept of the seven mountains by going to scripture. I'm going to read from the book of Matthew, chapter four, and I'm going to read from just verses eight through to ten. And I'm reading from the New King James Version, version so it might differ slightly from yours. The scripture says, post popular past passage of scripture that we know, uh, the temptation of Jesus, and it says the third and final temptation. Again, the devil took Jesus up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. I repeat, all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said, away with you, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only 
shall you serve. Okay, now to understand the revelation of the seven mountains of influence, we need to understand the importance of strategic planning and action. I repeat, strategic planning and action. And Bishop Francis um, spoke about being strategic in past uh, preparing the, the next leaders for their church and having a strategic plan um, and taking action on that. And I want to speak a bit to that and how it works within the seven mountains of influence. OK, so if you'll allow me for a short while, I just want to build this picture. We see in Luke chapter 10 and verse 18, the scripture tells us that Satan and his angels fell like lightning from heaven down into the earth and into the earthen realm. And it's here in the earth realm that they remain and set up and he set up his demonic kingdom to govern and to dominate the earth. Now, we know from Genesis 3 in the fall of, of, of humanity through the sin of Adam and Eve, that when they fell, what they did was seed and transfer the power and the authority that God had given to them. They transferred that to Satan and the kingdom of darkness to rule and dominate in the earth. Now, we come to the temptation of Jesus. And when Jesus is tempted, he's tempted in three points. And in that third temptation that we just read about, Satan offers to Jesus all of the kingdoms of the world and the glory. How could he offer it to them? He could offer it, offer it to Jesus because he had control of them. And he said, all of the kingdoms of the world and their glory, he said, I'll give it all onto you if you would simply bow down and worship me. And we know that Jesus did, did not do that. OK, so um, I just want to make a point here in that it's important we understand that sin is not static. Sin is not static and it's not stagnant. Sin continuously um, evolves. It recreates and, re 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 and represents itself. From generation to generation, it is constantly moving, constantly growing, constantly evolving. And just as sin is not static and it's not stagnant, neither is the kingdom of darkness. The demonic kingdom also continues to evolve and recreate and represent itself from generation to generation in the world in which we live. Now, I want to look at this concept of the seven mountains of influence, and I want to look at it from a concept within or from the perspective of, of business and, biz and business strategy, which is the field in which I work, work in. OK, now the demonic kingdom, Satan looks at the world, looks at our world as it is, and he asks himself this question, how can I? have maximum influence with minimal effort. I repeat, how can I have maximum influence with minimal effort? And from looking at the world, he sets up his structure and his organization to be able to do this, to have maximum influence with minimal effort. OK, so now when it comes to the mission of the demonic kingdom, we already know what this is. Scripture told us, John chapter 10, verse 10, it says the thief speaking of Satan and the demonic kingdom does not come except to steal, to kill and to destroy. And then Jesus said, I have come that they may have life and they may have it more abundantly. But I want to focus on that aspect of giving us that insight of the mission of the kingdom of darkness. It comes to steal, to kill and to destroy. Now, whilst we know the mission of the demonic kingdom, we many times have neglected to understand the strategy by which they seek to fulfill the mission. We can all have a mission, but there must be a plan. There must be a strategy and strategic action that takes place in order for us to see the vision come to, to pass. OK, so. In understanding the strategy 
of how the enemy operates, we need to understand this revelation of the seven mountains of influence. And I'll repeat them again, just so that we're all on the same page. We have the mountain of family, education, religion, government, media, arts and entertainment, and business. And these seven mountains of influence shape and form the culture of our nations. Okay, so now let's move a step further. And in moving a step further now, I'm going to answer the first question, which was, who is shaping our world? We touched on, uh, on what is shaping our world, and that's the seven mountains of influence. Now let's look a little bit closer at who is shaping our world. And in looking at who is shaping our world, what we are going to get an understanding of is positional power and influence. Positional power and influence. So let's go deeper into the strategy and why these mountains of influence are so important and why we need to have an understanding of them as leaders, but also as children of, of the kingdom of God. Okay. So the demonic realm understands something. It understands the necessity of human participation in order for its agenda to be advanced in the earth. I've often said to people that the most powerful thing in the earth is not the devil and the demonic kingdom, and it's not God, it's the human will. The human will is the most powerful thing in the earth, why do we know this? We know this because we know clearly that neither God nor the devil in the demonic kingdom can fulfill their desires and their agenda in the earth without the participation of the human will. You and I would not be able to be children of the kingdom of God and be born again if we did not exercise the power of our will to choose Christ. So the will of, of, of humanity is extremely powerful. So now the demonic kingdom understands that it needs human participation to advance its agenda in the earth. Okay, so human participation, what it does is it authorizes spiritual activity and agendas in the earth, whether positive or negative, whether godly or whether demonic. So, in historical battles and historical battle strategies, if you if you look into this subject matter, one thing that you um, one thing that you'll find is is that what was commonly found is that armies understood the importance of positions on the battleground, and what would often happen is one army would seek to take the high ground and would desire the high ground because having the high ground gives you an advantage in battle. When you have the high ground, you can see further. It's easier to fight going downhill than it is to go uphill. Just like in a, in a natural sense that, for example, if we if you're jogging, if you were jogging down a hill, you can jog faster and use less effort because you're going downhill. But if you're jogging uphill, you have to work harder to get to the top. OK, so in historical battles, armies always wanted to have a competitive advantage. And so they would opt to try and get the high ground. So the armies on the low ground now would then be in a position where they had to fight harder and push harder and be incredibly strategic to try and break through and get to the top of the mountain um, in, in, in the battle. OK. So now when we look at the seven mountains of influence, understand that it is a remnant of people that occupy the top of each mountain um, that has positional power and influence over the entirety of the mountain. I'll repeat that again. It's the people who occupy the top of the mountain that have the positional power and influence to dominate and control all of the mountain. Now, I specifically use the word remnant in this in this teaching. And why do I use the word remnant? Because it's always only a small percentage of people required 
to control the entire mountain. Now, if we think about the shape of a mountain, it's very much like a triangular shape, wide at the bottom, narrow at the head, uh, at, the at the top. So it can only be a few people at the top because there just is not enough space for everybody to occupy the top. So it's the few people, the remnant, who are at the top that have control power and influence over the entirety of the mountain. Now, I'll prove it from, an, from a very different kind of example. Um, I, I had a quick look at, at planes. And for example, uh, a 747 Boeing jet or aeroplane, it has the capacity to carry up to 467 passengers. Now, if you think of that plane as an organization of 467 people, on that organization. Now, in terms of who controls and who has the positional power and the influence of the plane taking off, go on a journey and arriving at a certain destination, that power, that positional power and influence lies with a remnant of people being the two pilots at the front of the plane and the cabin crew that are helping um, administrate the organization but yet you have 467 people on that organization, but yet it's just a remnant of a few people who have the positional power and influence to control exactly where that plane goes to. I want to take this a step further and look at a case study um, of Beats headphones. Many of you are familiar with Beats headphone, uh, headphones. Now, some of you may already know that I work for, I work for Apple. Um, I've been working for the organization now for seven, seven years. And um, I started off as a contractor for two years. Then I've been with the business directly as a direct employee for five years. And I work within the corporate side of the business in the um, account management and sales in a and sales capacity. Okay. And being in my job has allowed me to see how the seven mountains of influence operate and function from the inside. Being within an organization that is the richest organization in the world and has incredible influence and power over nations, not just one nation, but over nations of, of the earth. So in 2004, Apple buys Beats headphones. But the question is, why did they buy Beats headphones for what was um, $3.1 billion? Why did they invest so much money in, in acquiring um, this, this brand and this company? So let me give you a bit of history on the company. So um, Beats was started back in 2006 by two cultural icons of the arts and entertainment mountain. OK, now arts and entertainment falls under one mountain. They're not two separate mountains. OK, so you had two cultural icons of the arts and entertainment mountain being Jimmy Iovine and Dr. Dre. Jimmy Iovine, for those who don't know, he is a, a, an iconic and legendary music producer who produced uh, music for John Lennon and many other um, well-known uh, musical acts. And then he transitioned from just being a music producer to then becoming a music executive and running some of the biggest um, music companies in the world. Okay, so that's Jimmy Iovine. And then you have Dr. Dre, who is an iconic hip hop music producer um, who Many, particularly of the younger generation, include and myself, grew up hearing his music, etc. So they came together, and Dr. Dre had um, his own record company. But Jimmy Iovine, his record company was under the um, was under the authority of Jimmy Iovine's record company. Um, so his company was called Interscope Records, and they were close friends and are still close friends. And then they came up with this concept that 
music was changing and shifting. And even that, when we talk about the mountains of influence, Apple had a significant role to play in shifting the culture and in controlling not just um, one mountain in terms of a business mountain, a technology mountain, but Apple as a business has control and has influence over multiple of the seven mountains of influence because we create products in and as a business we create uh, music and we have various companies that work um that all are a part of an organization that impact multiple spheres of influence okay so they come up with this idea that as music is changing as music shifted from um being analog to being digital that the younger generation were not hearing music in the way it was created uh, to be heard so they decided that they would create a headphone company that would make um, that would allow the hearers to hear music in the way it has been created by the producers in the studio. And they called that company Beats um, Beats Headphones. OK, so now we come to 2013 and in two by 2013, bearing in mind that they came into they started the business in 2006. So in a very short span of time, Beats headphones became the number one headphone brand globally in the world. Now, bear in mind that you have other headphone brands. For example, Sennheiser. Sennheiser has, um, was a company started in 1945, uh, an audio um, headphone business established for decades. If you look at um, Bose, and Bose, um, uh, Bose headphones. Bose headphones, they were created back in 1964. And yet Beats headphones in the space of, was it seven years, became the number one headphone brand in the world and has maintained that position, now only overtaken by Apple itself with the release of our AirPods. AirPods are now the number one selling headphone in the world and Beats headphones are number two. How did that happen so quickly? This is what I want to now dig into to give life to this subject of the seven mountains of influence. Um, so the way they did it was that Jimmy Iovine and Dr. Dre being cultural icons and recognizing they were already at the top of the arts and entertainment mountain, they already had significant influence but they had a network of relationships with people across different spheres that um, that they could uh, utilize and use and use their influence to grow Beats headphones. So now I can share this now because this is now public knowledge, but at the time when it happened, it wasn't. Um, when Apple bought Beats, um, myself and a number of my colleagues were brought into a presentation and at the time it would have been a confidential presentation but now this information is is, is publicly known in this presentation uh, we had some of the top execs of beats headphones who were basically explaining to us the journey that beats have been on to grow the company to point that apple would acquire it and on this present in this presentation there was one slide that the moment i saw it it is, was etched in my mind and i've never forgot it and on this slide was a picture of a pyramid and there was lines going across the pyramid at different levels and where each line crossed was a different section of society so at the very bottom of the pyramid you had mass population you and i and as you went further up the pyramid or up the mountain there were different people of different greater uh, who had greater levels of influence within our society and within our culture and within the nations of the world. And at the top of the mountain, you had what that was referred to as the top 3% of influencers in society. At that top peak, there was um, sports stars, there was celebrities, there was actresses, there was music, um, uh, music uh, uh, only producers, music artists, etc. And Beats made a strategic move to specifically target and utilize their relationships at the top of the arts and entertainment mountain to impact everyone underneath.
So Jimmy Iovine, as a record executive, he then made it a requirement that when any of his artists on his record label created a music video, they had to have Beats headphones in the video. This is what we call in marketing with the um, subject that I studied at university, um, product placement. So you see now product placement taking place in all of the music videos. All of the sports stars now were endorse, endorsing Beats headphones. So they would wear them. LeBron James would wear Beats headphones walking onto the basketball court. Footballers would wear Beats headphones when they were um, uh, hanging out before uh, a game or, or getting off the, off the bus at a, new, at a stadium. So now the mass population are seeing the iconic individuals within society who they look up to and who they aspire to and they see them wearing Beats headphones and they say, I want Beats headphones too. Okay, so that's how now they grew the business to the point that it was so successful that in the space of, uh, if I get my maths right, say seven years, they overtook Sennheiser and Bolts and became top and, and, and the number one selling brand in the world. They targeted the high places of the mountains of influence. Okay, I'm now going to go into a second case study. And bear with me on this because you may think, Brother Richard, where are you going with this? But I want to present a case study to you on the LGBT community. Because what they have done and what they are doing has had tremendous impact on culture and on society, but how have they done it? Once again, this is all tying into seven mountains of influence. So according to the UK um, statistics from the Office of National Statistics, in 2018, the LGBT community represented only 2.2% of the UK population, 2.2%. So, the question then comes is how have they shifted the entire culture and caused our laws and our education system to be changed? They did it by strategically targeting the top of these mountains, targeting the people and the individuals who had the most significant influence and positional power to impact and affect society at large. So I wanted to share something with you two weeks ago because of some of the work I do with uh, within Apple. There's some things that I've been working on, particularly around um, equality in regards to racial issues um, and uh, and diversity within organizations, et cetera, et cetera. But I believe this was really by the will of God that an opportunity was opened up to me a couple of weeks ago. And because of one of the relationships I have within the organization, I was invited with a few other people to join a conference, uh, a conference meeting, which was four hour session, which had the top 150 business leads in the UK, Europe, Middle East, India and Africa. And I joined this meeting and as I say, it was a four hour long session addressing a number of issues that are impacting organizations um, from equality, inclusion, diversity, all of these things. And within this meeting, they brought in um, a particular gentleman who is a specialist and an expert in his field um, to speak about, for example, issues with regards to race within organizations. But the man in question himself is, he, he is gay. And he is one of the front running LGBT rights lawyers in the United States. And he's got an organization that's been pivotal in shaping and moving the needle in regards to their rights across nations of the earth. And in this meeting, he said something that as he said it, I said, goodness me, look at that. This is how they have had such an impact on culture and on and only our nation, but upon nations of the earth. He said, and I'm quoting him, the reason why we were able to get uh, uh, equal marriage in the UK was because we, um, we have been strategic in our actions to move people's perception of our community and acceptance of us 
over a prolonged period of us being strategic. And he said, within that strategy, one of our objectives has always been to get the majority to align with us and to stand with us to, to allow us to get breakthrough for equal rights. Now listen to that. Remember, a community that only represents 2.2% of our population. And just for just to give some context to this, the, um, the EU Commission has just um, concluded a study and they released the results on the 20th of December 2020 that says in the UK, 59.3% of the population identify as Christian. Okay, 59.3% of the population identifies Christian, but yet 2.2% of our nation has been able to shift and change the laws and the education system and various aspects of our culture and of our society. How? So he said this, he said, the reason why we were able to get equal marriage in the UK is because, not because we have the position of power, because we're a minority. He said, it's because we got the majority to align with us, to give us momentum and power to be able to break through. He took a step further. He said, we knew that we were breaking through when we first got um, uh, civil, civil partnerships were allowed in the UK. But we were very clear on our objective that even as civil partnerships were now allowed, we knew that we were breaking through. So we didn't rest on our laurels. We got even more focused and we got even more strategic and more aggressive in our pressure on governments, on influencers, on celebrities, on people who have significant influence at the top of the mountain, that they would align with us, that then if they're aligning with us, the fans and the people that follow them would be more inclined to align with us, that we can get positional power and momentum to be able to break through. So we started with civil partnership, but we knew we weren't going to stop there. We kept pressing and within a short space of time, we were able to break through and now equal marriage was passed in the UK. How did they do it? They did it by targeting the top of the mountain, targeting those who have the greatest influence in our society and getting them to align with their cause and through their power and their influence and their position, be able to change our culture and our society. It's now gone so far as that the EU Commission in 2020, they launched their first ever strategy for all EU states. Um, their, sorry, their first LGBT strategy for all EU states. And it's got a number of points on there, which you can see on the EU Commission site of what they are endeavouring to do such that there is equality across all of the EU states. But this right here is once again an example of these spheres of influence, the LGTB community have been able to influence our educational system. They've been able to influence our political system. They're influencing significantly in the business world. I just recently read a statistic that says um, that uh, gay men are the most likely to become CEOs and leaders of major corporations because of the fact that many of them do not have children, so they are very much devoted to their careers, they can progress and promote, uh, uh, progress even faster, at a faster rate to get to the top of organisations. So now I go to a key point. Whoever occupies the top of the mountains, the spirits that they are in agreement with have free reign and influence over the mountains. So if the most influential people in government are not aligned to the kingdom of God and live according to the pattern of this world, the spirits that govern them and in many cases also influence and control them impact the entire nation. It goes for the same in business. Why have we seen all of so many issues of Ponzi schemes and corruption in the business world, in the financial sectors and, and embezzlement and all of these kinds of things? Why? Because people who are in the most significant positions, who are not walking or living for God, and who are many are uh, bound by greed and, 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 and corruption, all of these things impact and influence the culture. So, 
I go back to the point I made earlier, that participation of the human will will authorize spiritual and um, spiritual agendas in the earth, whether godly or demonic. So now with what I've said, the question is, how do we respond? And I can see time is fast going, so I'm going to have to do this very briefly. Last year, God spoke to me in a time of prayers, and he said something to me that was very deep and profound. He said, too many of my people are spirit filled and yet wisdom empty. I repeat, too many of my people are spirit filled and yet wisdom empty. What is wisdom? Wisdom is the ability to solve problems and to make decisions. And wisdom can only be applied when there is knowledge. So to the leaders who were dialed into this conference, I believe there are three action points that are important for leaders. And I'm talking of pastoral leaders, et cetera, as well as leaders outside of the pastoral uh, field, but particularly pastoral leaders. Leaders need to understand the culture because if you don't understand what's going on with music, and that's one you could we could talk about for hours. If we don't understand what's going on in government, not even just at a national level, but local government, what's happening in your area, in your borough where your church is or your church is located? Do we know what's happening in the education sector? What is happening in culture? We need to understand it. And I would encourage every leader to take time to understand what is happening in culture. If you want to know what's happening in youth culture, talk, talk to some of your young people, talk to family members who, who are saved right now and ask and find out what is happening in youth culture because it's having a profound impact upon, um, upon our youth, but even upon our society at large. What's happening in education? What's happening governmentally, as I said, in your borough? Or what's happening nationally? What are the current social media trends? We need to understand culture that we're living in, the culture we're living in. Second thing, leaders need to build strategic relationships and alliances. I pose the question, do you know who the MP is for your area? or who the leaders or the MPs are for each political party in your area and what their views are and what they're trying to do within the community. Because could there be the opportunity that there is something that the church can align with or something that the church can do to help support local initiatives that give us credibility, power and influence in the local area and beyond? Do you know what the major social issues, still linking with point number two, do you know what the major social issues are that affect your local area your, or your local borough that the church can provide a solution for? For example, food banks. If you own your own building, is there opportunity that you could be a, a source of a food bank to help connect with the local community, minister to the local community, which we train so excellently in, in evangelism, missions and those kind of things, and to be able to connect with the local community and engage souls at local level, whilst at the same time being uh, uh, having impact on a social level and on a, uh, and on a government level with your local MPs, etc. And then third point, leaders need to deploy the saints to have cultural impact within these spheres of influence. And I pose this, who are the modern day Josephs? Who are the modern day Daniels in the body of Christ? Who are the more, remember when God took the children of Israel, he gave to one tribe, the Levites, to priesthood and then to the others, what did they do? They were skilled individuals. Some were in business and in other things. But within your, um, Bishop Francis did an excellent job of talking about developing leadership to continue uh, the work from a, from a ministry perspective. But could it be that within your church right now, there is the next entrepreneur who will make an invention that could be a multi-billion pound invention? What would that mean to the impact that the, your local church could have and that the kingdom of God can have? 
Could it be that there are people, there are there are talented and gifted all uh, 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 all authors in your church that could be writing the next books? Could it be that there are phenomenal entrepreneurs right in your pews right now? Could it be that there are talented and gifted musicians who could be um, who could release music that changes the atmosphere and the climate in people's homes when they hear it? That give people uh, hope and give freedom. That the anointing on their life when they release music could break strongholds who are these individuals in the body of christ today and are they sitting in our pews right now we need to develop leadership for ministry but we also need to now become strategic and develop leadership to impact society at all levels we need Christians in politics. We need Christians in the education system in significant places. We need leaders in business. We need leaders in arts and entertainment. And with the with the the, the foundation that we have, we get in church through the through the Bible school and through the teaching and the preaching on the Sunday. Um, our our hearts have not been contaminated by the ways of this world. Our hearts are purified. So now we're going into these spheres with the spirit of God rather than operating the spirit of the world and we can be utilized by God just as Joseph was, just as Daniel was to impact culture and society and have social impact. That in a time where people are trying to question the relevance of the church, we would be proven to be extremely relevant by the works that we do that impact people's lives. Wow, time is fast spent. But there are four things that I believe we need to see happen. I, and I'm just gonna jump through very quickly. For those who are not fivefold leaders in ministry, I believe we need to see purpose or assignment awakening. I pose this question, do you know who you are and do you know what your assignment is? You may not be called to ministry, but if you're not called to ministry, what are you called to? What is your assignment? What has God gifted to you? That's the second point. We need gifting activation. Your gifting is aligned to your assignment. So we need giftings to be activated. And I'm not just talking about um, ministry giftings, but I'm talking about, for example, the gifting for entrepreneurship, the gifting for law, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The gifting to be, uh, um, to be, uh, 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 say, for example, a surgeon and the skill set that it takes to do that. We need gifting activation. We need increased anointing. Why do we need increased anointing? Because if we're talking about taking territory by going into uh, going into these mountains and having influence, you will come up against opposition. You will come up against enemies. Did not Jesus say, thou preparest a table for me, not in the presence of my friends, but in the presence of my enemies. When you seek to enter and into the high places and have influence in these mountains, there will be powers that will seek to oppose you. There will be people that will seek to oppose you. But we have the spirit of God. We know how to pray. We know how to do spiritual warfare. We know how to fast. We know how to intercede. And we utilize the tools that God has given to us to advance the kingdom of God and take, and take territory with the kingly anointing that he has given to us. And number four, we need wisdom impartation. Jesus said, be as harmless as a dove, but be as wise as a serpent. We need wisdom impartation in how we engage in these areas of influence to be able to be effective in being a light in dark places. And I close on this scripture before questions are posed. Matthew chapter 5 verse 14 to 16 says, You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket. Or on, a, or on a lamp, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Now, Jesus, you are the light of the world. If we are the light of the world, we are therefore called to be a light to the world. But God said something to me as I was preparing this. He said, I never created light to shine amongst light. I created light to go and shine in dark places. 
There is darkness that's operating in the in the mountain of business where corruption and greed is ruling and succeeding. We need light bearers who will go in and who will change and shift the paradigm. In the education sector, we need light bearers in there who will have position of influence to be able to pro, um, uh, make decisions that impact nations. And in all of the other mountains that I've mentioned, we need light bearers in dark places to be a light that will help people um, and nations to do things the way the kingdom of God desires for it to be done. Jesus said this, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What is the kingdom of God? The kingdom of God is God's way of doing things. We need to show the world God's way of doing things that when we do things his way, it works and it produces results. God bless you all. I'm going to stop there. And um, if, there, if there are questions, then I will do my best to answer them. God bless you. Thank you so much, Richard, and an excellent presentation. There is a lot to this subject. I have not seen any questions as yet, but I would like to pose one in a short while. Um, I think. Uh, there are seven mountains. I, I, I wish I would have heard a little bit about one particular mountain. <laughs> uh, perhaps you could just give a brief, just a brief summary. The mountain of religion. Uh, only because we're here um, preaching the gospel. But I'd like to hear what information you have very briefly about the mountain of religion and its influence in the world. Go ahead. Okay, so uh, the mountain of religion, the reason why people refer to it as the mountain of religion is because the enemy's strategy adapts based on the environment. So for example, the enemy, for example, in the Middle East, he he's already got a stronghold there because it's majority, for example, Muslim. But in the mountain of religion, we have, for example, for us in the UK, and we are the church. We have the church mountain. And as the church mountain, many times we are going out and we are evangelizing, we're calling people into, uh, into, the kingdom, into the kingdom of God. Now, one of the challenges in regards to the church mountain, and this, even in this, you can see the strategy of the kingdom of darkness, is that God made the body of Christ and it's a body, but many times we don't function as a body. And there is separation, organizationally, denominationally, et cetera, et cetera. And so in, in us moving forward, there needs to be a, a coming together around common goals and common issues and us working together and recognizing that the, the anointing that is upon the church is powerful, that we have been anointed with such a, a, an anointing that we can go and we can impact and influence all of the other mountains. So my message would be for us who are in the, in, in the kingdom of God, which I'm hoping on in this call is, we need to be aligned and very strategically about how do we deploy all of the resources that we have. The, we've got um, well-educated, in terms of kingdom-educated individuals in our churches that can go and carry the message of doing things God's way in these other mountains. I hope I've answered questions. Thank you. There. Uh, thank you, Richard. Um, I'm still waiting. Folks are saying good things in the chat, in the chat but I want to ask um, another question. Um, yeah. This is really, um, for those who have not heard of this type of teaching and understanding, because it affects our entire world, but I just want to say, given the importance of this, and given that Satan has a strategic plan, what would be your strategic plan for how the church should pray? So, very good, very good question. Um, so, there are 
I would say really the strategic plan would be the four points that I mentioned um, previously. I think the church should be praying for, if you want to say, end time Josephs, end time Daniels, people who were full of the spirit of God and the wisdom of God, who can strategically go into these um uh, into these areas and these spheres of influence to be able to have an impact because it's it's not an easy undertaking. I'll give you an example. Do you remember a few years ago, 2018, I think it was 2015 to 2018, uh, the Liberal, De Liberal, Liberal Democrats, their leader was Tim Fallon. Now, I'm not trying to get into politics here, but I want he, there's an example here that we can use. He He's a born again Christian. And he decided now as the leader, obviously he's going to run in the general election. And as a born again Christian and people knowing he was a born again Christian, what happened? There was what I refer to as a demonic backlash that came against him where he could not stand in front of the media without them hammering about what are your views on same sex marriages? What are your views on the LGBT community? And they came at him aggressively, why? Because the spirits already have that high place. So now that they saw somebody who's a part of the king operating in their sphere, they said, no, we don't want to lose our position because they fought hard to get it. At that point, the pressure got so much, he ended up bowing out. But in times like that, the church should have been strategically aligning and coming together and praying for him so that he could stand against the onslaught of the attack. So I believe we need to now begin to pray for people who are called by God and gifted by God and have the wisdom of God to go into these spheres and to have impact. We do a fantastic do job of training people in kingdom truth. Um, but now it's about deploying people and asking God, God, give us the wisdom and the vision and the foresight to see um to see how these other areas of influence can be impacted and to deploy people. Um, with that, I also believe we need to be aligned to understand what is happening in society. So for example, um, and I know time is quickly going, but just over, was it just over 18 months ago, a bill was brought in the Houses of Parliament where the government began to recognise the issue of how easy the access is for young people to get access to pornographic material online. The government were trying to pass a bill that would require people to have to input their, uh, their details on a government website so that it could be checked that people are truly of age to be able to view adult content. Now, when this was happening, this was an opportunity for the church to know this and to be praying and to be interceding for us to be pushed through. Why? Because if that had been passed, because what ended up happening was there was a backlash. Other liberal groups came against it and they overturned it. And so it didn't pass. But what would have happened if it had passed? It means we would have helped in, in, in pushing back the darkness that is overtaking many of our young people and adults as well. So I believe we need to pray for a purpose and assignment awakenings. We need to pray for gifting activations, people who have got giftings in them that are dormant. They may not even realize they're gifted in certain areas for those giftings to be acti activated. We need to pray for increased anointing to be able to fight the spiritual battles that come with trying to take this kind of territory. And we certainly need to pray for an abundance of wisdom because you are, you know, um, uh, was it Jesus said that, um, you know, uh, the, the disciples were going out as sheep in the midst of wolves. To enter into culture and into society and have an impact, we're literally entering like sheep in the midst of wolves. Okay, thank you, Richard. I have a question here. Um, I'll read it, and I think we have five more minutes. Now, the comment is, it started as a comment, then it's a question. Often in church, if you're not in church ministry, I find people try to dismiss your work that can and does show God's glory outside of church. How do we mitigate against this? Now, I'm assuming the person 
who's asking this question that the person in question, this is an assumption, is a sanctified person. They're born again and they're spirit filled. Because if people are not born again and spirit filled, then the question doesn't carry as much weight as it does. So let me repeat. My assumption is that the person posing this question and the circumstances they're portraying is that this person is a born again person, spirit filled. So read it again. Often in church, if you're not in church ministry, I find people try to dismiss your work that can and does show God's glory outside of church. How do we mitigate against this? Okay. Um, the way that we, I would say, any person mitigate against it is I would say every individual needs to have a clear understanding of that God uses us not just within the church, but outside of the church, even within our, um, for example, our day-to-day -day jobs and our careers to have an impact. And I would say build, build if you want to say, a foundation in the word of God of, of examples of this. I've mentioned, for example, Joseph. Joseph's a perfect example of a kingdom man operating within a secular environment and yet that secular environment was uh, benefited and blessed as a result of his presence and his leadership. Um, we can look at Daniel and three um, Hebrew boys. They're another example of it. But I would say for any uh, for that individual and for anyone else is know that there are examples in the scripture and look at those examples, understand those examples. And even if you may, for example, if you may not, uh, feel that uh, you're being appreciated within the church because you're doing things that are outside of the church. If you know that God has gifted you and is giving you opportunities of influence in the area that you work, then be comfortable and confident in that. Because God is doing this right now in phenomenal ways. And I know personal examples of people who God is strategically positioned in very influential positions in our society. And you wouldn't know of them and nobody would know of them. But they are king minded, spirit filled people who are making decisions that are impacting our nation right now. So I hope that answers your question accordingly. Um, and hopefully in time, pastors, leaders, and many more people within church will realize that um, not every assignment that God gives to the church is necessarily a fivefold ministry assignment. There is assignments for leadership. And actually, I'll give you a very good example that, um, of this. John Maxwell. How many of us have read John Maxwell's books? He is a man who God is using when he gets called to Muslim nations, uh, uh, Hindu nations. He goes throughout the world. And what is he teaching? Read his books. He is teaching kingdom principles, Christ-centered principles on leadership. And he's teaching leadership to significant leaders. So know that there are people who are doing the things that you are alluding to there. And if everybody doesn't see it, then so be it. That's fine. But don't let that stop you. If you know God has called you and given you the gifting and the ability to be influential within these spheres. Okay, I think our time is up. Thank you so much, Richard. I, I felt this subject was one, first of all, I felt this was something I wanted to be taught from an educational point of view. And I'll give you an example. Um, Brother Philip mentioned that he's, you know, he's been a minister for 40 years. Okay, I've been saved now 41 years. And this is, this, is, this is something that I would say all pastors need to get a grip of. If you ask me what is going on in the world now, I have no idea. Now, it's not because I'm so holy that I don't know. But as an individual and as a pastor, I have to make it my business to know what's going on out there. 
And the only way I know what's going on out there is when people are converted and they come into the church, I ask them, what's the latest thing? Because sometimes they have terminologies that they use. I have no idea what it means. So, and then different cultural backgrounds is critical that we have an understanding. And this is my take. If we're going to experience revival, we need to know what type of people are going to be coming into church. So if we're ignorant about the main influences out there, how on earth are we going to nurture them? Now, don't get me wrong. The word of God has its place, but I believe I need to understand. Okay, let me just give another example. Um, when it comes to, say, uh, say immorality, you know, in my time, just to say fornication, that was the biggest thing you could ever say. Now, if you don't know what people are going through, you would be shocked to know the impact um, immorality is having on the young generation. And until you hear from a person what they have been through and the things that are really impacting their lives. So what is my point? My point is that there needs to be an element of education for people like myself who have been in church for many, many years. and I. I haven't got a clue what's going on out there. So then when, now that I'm having a better understanding, I will reposition myself and, and help to reposition the ministry, how we can help people that's come from a different background, a different culture, exposed to different things. And so to me, this subject was about educating the body of Christ so we have an understanding of the world that we live in. We know who is at the top of everything. We know who is the God of this world. From a spiritual point of view, I don't think anyone needs to lecture us, but to be able to understand better how the church can be a positive influence in our society can only be a good thing. So I want to thank you, Richard, and I want to thank um, the other speakers, who, uh, Pastor Philip and Bishop Francis, and we're going to bring this session to an end. Um, I want to just say, uh, appreciate all of you have taken time out to be with us. The, the subjects were diverse, but all I felt was necessary. There are some follow-ups that we've had from, you know, both um, uh, Pastor Philip and indeed uh, Bishop Francis, that I will, I will take it upon me to do that when we look at further training within the district. Let me thank you all for coming on and we are gonna dismiss and we, we return tonight at 6.30 for our final service. And I want to say appreciate you all and thank you for your comments and thank you for the teachers that have spoken and may God bless you all. God bless you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Say God that will win tomorrow. For he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. If he had a mighty hand yesterday, si tuvo la mano poderosa de Dios ayer, then he has a mighty hand today, él tiene la mano poderosa en el and he will have a mighty hand tomorrow. Y él va a tener su mano poderosa día de and mañana. so we do not know the future, Nosotros no conocemos el futuro. but we know that God's hand is mighty in the future. Pero sabemos que la mano de Dios es Praise the Lord, brethren. My name is Pastor Joseph Toure from the Apostolic Fountain of Life, UPC in Woodbury. First and foremost, I want to thank the Lord for what God is doing. The psalmist says in Psalms 136, verse 1, say, O oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, and his mercy endureth forever. I also want to thank our district superintendent, 
Pastor Ellis and the district board for their tremendous work to ensure that this conference go ahead. We want to thank the Lord. We know we are living in an unprecedented time in which our way of worship have changed as Pentecostals. Regardless what is happening, Jesus is still Lord. Things have changed, but that didn't change the attributes of our God. We know that He's not bound, He's not restricted in any form or shape. So we pray that this year things will subside and we'll go back to our physical building with the same zeal and boldness of propagating the gospel of the kingdom. God bless you all. In Jesus' name, amen. seat is still covered just like Ananija there is mercy at the horns of the altar so he could live even though he deserved to die because Jesus is the one that can take away your sins Jesus is the one by which you must obtain mercy Jesus is the one that when you seek after mercy you will find him Hallelujah, Hallelujah. 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 Hallelujah.